Good morning. Thank you. Well, this morning we have a, a guest speaker with us. Um, Pastor Tim Pine is from First Baptist Church in Phillipsburg, New Jersey. Um, he's pastor of a couple of our students here, and he's the son of uh, Dr. Pine, who's one of our seminary professors. Um, and I've asked him to come and share with you. Not all of our graduates are in pastoral ministry, nor should they be. Um, we have graduates who do a variety of things. But Tim's one of those guys that from the time he arrived really was in pursuit of pastoral ministry. And uh, it's been really interesting and, and encouraging to watch him grow and develop and uh, really uh, grow that passion and see the opportunities that God's given him to minister in, um, in New Jersey. Um, uh, we talk often, and uh, man, I, I remember when COVID first hit, and a significant portion of his elderly population of his church were in the hospital with COVID, and, and uh, the, the challenges of being a pastor in those days. It was really um, encouraging to watch him uh, really shepherd his people in that way. So he's going to come and share with you today. Uh, welcome, Tim Pine. Good morning. Thank you, Boykin, for having me. I have to give a shout out to Will Wintermute and Noah Smiley. Hey, guys, good to see you. Uh, a little bit about me uh, as I, I, do you guys just call him Boykin? I, uh, he's in my phone as Papa B, but that's okay. Um, but as Boykin said, I, I, uh, I am so thankful to be back in a place that meant so much to my spiritual development uh, and uh, my wife and I started dating here, uh, even though we knew each other before that. Uh, but I am married. I've been married for 11 and a half years now. We have four children, uh, nine, nine, five, and three. Uh, one of them looks like us, the three-year-old does. Uh, one of the nine-year-olds we adopted a few years ago. And then the other two, the nine-year-old and five-year-old, we actually get to adopt this Friday uh, which is very, yeah, you can clap for that because it's very exciting for us. Um, so we have been fostering them for, I think, 1,594 days or something like that, and we're glad that's almost done. And so that's this Friday, and we're very excited, and I'm really thankful just to be able to serve Jesus. I actually uh, got connected to the church I'm at now in Phillipsburg, New Jersey, while, while I was here as a student. They needed help in their youth ministry, and so I just started uh, driving there and helping out there, and I've just been there ever since. And so God's been so good. Uh, and if, if you, by the way, uh, sense a call to vocational ministry, and God has gifted you in the area of music, uh, especially maybe in even youth ministry, I would enjoy having a conversation with you. Uh, I'll be here until lunch today, and I'll be at lunch today. Um, but we're, uh, we're looking for to add to our staff and seeing what God might want to do there. Um, and I'm thankful for the opportunity to open God's word with you today. That's, that's why we are here. Uh, and so if you have a Bible, and I hope you do, I would love for you to open your Bible to Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. Uh, at, at the beginning of every message I, I preach, I say that I want people to know it doesn't matter what I think. What matters is what the Bible says. And I hope you believe that. It doesn't matter what I think. What matters is what the Bible says. What I have to say today does not matter unless it agrees with what God has said in his word. So we want his truth uh, to be our focus, not just for the next few minutes, but uh, every minute of our lives. And our church has been going through uh, the book of Colossians. The reason why I'm here today is because as Boyk and I talk sometimes, I'm telling him about what I'm preaching on and told him about this message in Colossians, and he thought it would be a great thing for me to be able to share. And so uh, that's so we're going through this series in Colossians, so this is just a small part of what we've been going through. Uh, but the purpose for us, as we've been going through the book of Colossians, has been this, that, that we would see the supremacy and the centrality of Christ in everything. We would see the supremacy and the centrality of Christ in everything. Because unless and until Jesus is at the center of your life, 
nothing else will make sense. Until he is who we value the most, we won't be able to value other things correctly. And, and I pray that you have come to the place in your life where you realize that your only hope in this life is having more of Jesus. Have you realized that for yourself? Your only hope in this life is having more of Jesus. We need to be so filled with him that there's no room for anything else. Because in our brokenness, the Bible doesn't point us to a program, and it doesn't point us to a system. It points us to a person. And his name is Jesus. And when you really find him, there's no need to search anywhere else. Because as Colossians 2 says, Jesus is the treasure who contains all the treasure. All the treasure of wisdom and knowledge are found in him. When you find Jesus, your search is over. And, and, and part of the beauty of the gospel is that if you are in Christ, your identity has been completely transformed. We're no longer captive to our sin-sick nature encapsulated by breaking down bodies, right? We are no longer spiritually dead, separated from God. In Christ, we are made alive, we are forgiven, and we are victorious. That's part of the focus of Colossians chapter 2. And embracing that new identity that we found, find in Jesus frees us up to run further into him because the guilt and shame that would have held us back is now gone. It's been nailed to the cross. And, and the reason that Paul goes to great lengths in the book of Colossians to emphasize who Jesus is, which is what, what he does in chapter 1, and then to emphasize our identity in Christ, which is what he does in chapter 2, he, he's talking to this group of young believers, Colossians, young believers. It's a church that Paul's never been to. He hears about it from Epaphras. He writes them this letter to these new believers, and he saw he saw emphasizing who Jesus is and then our identity in him as the best defense against false teaching who, who were trying to dilute the gospel by just adding other stuff to it. Because at the heart of most temptation and most false teaching, including Colossae, is this lie. Jesus is insufficient. That, that's the lie that you see when you're, when you're being tempted. That's the lie of false teaching. Jesus is insufficient. And his insufficiency can be made up for by adding something else. Right? So when you're, when you're tempted today, right? The, the question that you're basically going to be asking is, is Jesus enough? Is, is Jesus' word enough? And, 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 and most false teaching doesn't outright, outright deny Jesus' existence. They, they make him share the stage with something else. And so chapter 2 of Colossians ends by teaching that Christianity is not Jesus plus legalism or Jesus plus asceticism, making a, rig, a religion out of self-denial, or Jesus plus mysticism, because Christianity is not Jesus plus anything else. It's Jesus plus nothing that equals everything. The promise of Christianity is, is that you get Jesus and that he's enough no matter what else comes or goes. That he is sufficient, which is why he needs to be central to everything that we do. So all of that leads up to chapter 3, where Paul is going to call the church to live and, th and, and think based on where Jesus is. Because that's where our ultimate identity is. And, and so as I read these verses, and I'll have them on the screen as well, I want you to notice the repetition of with Christ, with Christ, in Colossians 3, 1 through 4, which says this, If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on things above that are on the earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. So three times in those four verses, he's emphasizing we are with Christ. We are with Christ. And, and I just want you to know that being a follower of Jesus is amazing. And no matter how amazing you think it is, it's even better than that. It's, it's better than we think. And, and the New Testament is often calling us to embrace realities that are nearly beyond comprehension for us. And I think you see some of those in these four verses. 
think about this. Your life is hidden with Christ in God. Right? Just let your mind be blown by that this afternoon. Let that mess you up for a little bit, okay? Like, my, my life is hidden with Christ in God. You can seek heavenly things even while you are surrounded by earth's realities. And, and so I don't begin to presume that the full implications of this passage will be grasped over the course of 35 minutes together or even the course of a week, a month, a year, uh, which is why I love being a pastor and I love pastoral ministry because I get to be in it for the long haul with people and, and we get to grow in our understanding and application of God's word together. And it's easy to overestimate what you can accomplish in the short term but underestimate what God can accomplish in the long term. I think that happens a lot. We overestimate what we can accomplish in the short term, but we underestimate what God can do in the long term. And even if while we are talking through these verses, the full implications of this passage seem way beyond where you are today, I don't want you to be discouraged. And I, I'm praying that wherever you find yourself right now, that you will have a little bit more of a heavenly mentality this week than you had last week as a result of the truth of God's word. Because how we think determines how we live. How we think determines how we live. This is why so much of the spiritual battle that we face is a battle for our minds. You are in a battle for your mind because how you think determines how you live. So God's word is calling us to have a heavenly mentality, and that's not calling us to live in a fantasy world. This is actually meant to be tremendously practical, and that actually becomes more evident if you go through the rest of Colossians chapter 3, which I just got the privilege of doing with our church. Boy, can you will have to have me back if you want that. But uh, you can read that later on today and just see how practical living with an eternal perspective, a heavenly mentality is. Uh, and so we're not talking about being so heavenly minded that we're no earthly good. Have you guys heard that phrase before? This person's so heavenly minded that they're no earthly good. Because that's not even a thing. Just for the record, if, if you are so heavenly minded that you are no earthly good, then you're not actually heavenly minded in the way the Bible tells us to be heavenly minded. <laughs> uh, I, I think uh, Scott Hubbard made this point, and he, and he, and he, point, and he said, who, who was the most heavenly minded man of all? I think most people would agree it's Jesus. It's a good Sunday school answer, and it's also correct. And think about Jesus, the most heavenly minded man ever, labored and sweated and healed and touched and bled for this world in need. So no one was more heavenly minded than Jesus and no one did more earthly good than Jesus. This is practical. There's no such thing as being so heavenly minded you're no earthly good because if you're no earthly good, you're not actually heavenly minded. And so if I could just put this question in your mind as we walk through this passage, this is what it would be. Are you living here and now in light of there and then? Are you living in the here and now in light of there and then? Has the way you have lived this week been dictated and influenced by what is true in heaven now and what will be true in eternity then? Are you living here and now, not as if it is there and then, but in light of there and then? If we are going to seek the things that are above, if we are going to set our minds on things above, then we are going to have a heavenly, and, and have a heavenly mentality. I, I think there's three truths that we must believe from this passage. Three truths from this passage that we have to believe in order to have a heavenly mentality. And verses 1 and 2 give us the first one. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on things that are on the earth. So the first thing we see is that a heavenly mentality believes that Jesus is reigning. Jesus is reigning. He is seated at the right hand of God. He is in the place of authority and worship. And, and just to be upfront, which I think we should be, right? If, Jesus, if God is not real and Jesus is not sovereignly reigning, over his creation, then nothing else I say today or any other day I give a message matters. If, if God is not real and Jesus is not reigning, nothing I say today matters. 
it, it would just all be religious make-believe. Happy thoughts completely divorced from any practical reality. But if Jesus who was crucified by Roman soldiers on a real day in history, rose from the dead, ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of God. If he is the one who ultimately reigns, no matter who presently sits on earthly thrones or positions of power, if, if Colossians 1, 15 through 20 is true, that Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, for by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, and visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he's the head of the body, the church. He's the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell and through him to reconcile all things to himself, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. If that is true, then that has tremendous implications for how we think. Would you guys agree? All right, if, if Jesus is everything the Bible says that he is, that should change the way we think. We, we seek things that are above because that's where Jesus is. We set our minds on things above because we recognize that earthly things have to come in submission to his heavenly authority. And I think it's safe to say that we live in a very distracted culture. Anyone want to argue with that? No, very distracted. There's lots of competition for your attention. And often, something on a screen is winning that competition, right? And, and, and you have this thing that's usually in your pocket or, or in your purse, and, it, and it's constantly saying, look at this, and click on this, and then this, and then this, and then this, and, and buy this, and get mad about this, and compare yourself to this. And, 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 and we're all like, yeah, I want to do that more. I want to do that all the time. I, I, I want to do that instead of going to sleep at night. And how is it 1 a.m. already? And how does the algorithm know me better than my parents? Like, what is going on? Right? We're, we're very distracted. And, and we're constantly told what we should be anxious about or outraged about or discontent without. And most of it is temporary, but it is presented like it is the most significant thing ever, right? Everything is clickbait and everything is, you won't believe what just happened. And we're so distracted by it. And, 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 and here's what I would compare it to. Uh, you, you know when you're taking a picture of something, how, how, how you can mess with the perspective Right, and you can have something really close to the camera so it looks really big, and then the thing in the background looks really small. Right, so you can have a three-year-old look like it's holding up the Golden Gate Bridge or something, right, because the three-year-old's close and the Golden Gate Bridge is back there. Um, I would observe that is the way information and news and entertainment and everything is being presented to us in 2023. Right? Everything is right in front of the camera. Right? Everything is breaking news and the most important thing ever, and you have to see this right now. Everything's an existential crisis, and you won't believe what just happened, and we are part of this giant experiment to see what happens to a culture when everything is huge and outrageous and tantalizing. And, and I think this is part of why young people especially are so overwhelmed right? Be and anxious because everything is so big and it's so important and it demands immediate attention or action and, and it's hard to know how to process all of that. And everything is fighting for space at the forefront of your minds, right? Everything is fighting for the space at the forefront of your minds all the time. And you know who often is pushed to the background when that happens? God is, right? God's back there. And because the perspective of our lens is so messed up, how does God often appear when we're going through difficult times? He looks small, doesn't he? He looks really small. 
And like, God, why aren't you, why aren't you doing more than you're doing right now? And how, how could you let this happen? And, and why don't you care? And, or, and, and so your mind just starts to get disoriented. And you're like, is he just not as powerful as I was, as I was told he was when I was growing up in church? Or does he, does he just not like me? Or did I do something wrong? Why doesn't he care more about me? This is so important and he's so far away. Why isn't he doing anything? And the Golden Gate Bridge is not smaller than the three-year-old. And God is not smaller than your problems. But sometimes he looks that way. Sometimes he looks that way. And Paul is actually giving us the solution in Colossians chapter 3. He's telling us to move the lens of our minds up. And to realize that there is someone who is above all of this mess, and his name is Jesus, and he is still in charge. Amen, CSU? He, he's still, nope, okay, that's fine. I'll just keep going, and you can decide if you agree with me at the end, okay? He is still in charge. He is reigning, and he is far more significant and valuable than all the other earthly things that have distracted you this week. Uh, this is why, as a pastor, we seek to make much of Jesus when we gather together as a church on Sundays, right? Because all week long, we're in a world that is telling us, make much of this, and, and look at how significant this is, and, and click on this, and then this, and then this, and then this, and, and, and make much of yourself, and zoom in real close, and pretend like you're not a broke college student, and buy this, and set your mind on earthly things, and how you don't have enough of them yet. And, and by the way, if you're wondering what fits into a category of an earthly thing, that, as Paul's talking about here, that we're not supposed to set our minds on, I would say it's anything that denies the reality of Jesus' authority and demand for worship. An earthly thing is anything that denies the reality of Jesus' authority and demand for worship. Anything that moves Jesus to the background and anything else to the foreground. Anything that tries to take Jesus' place on the authoritative throne. So human traditions, man-made philosophies, human wisdom. We see this everywhere. Love is love. I just want you to be happy. Follow your heart. Trust your gut. Identity being found in what you do for a living. Success being defined by how much money you make. You deserve better. You deserve to do something for yourself. The list is never ending. And you hear these messages all the time. And, and maybe you tell some of them to yourself, and then we come together for chapel, or we come together on Sundays for just a few minutes, and, and last Sunday at our church, we sang, Christ is enough for me. Christ is enough for me, because everything I need is in you. We sang, forever we will say, you're the Lord our God. And what are we doing as we come together and we sing those types of songs? We are seeking to alter the perspective of our minds, to put Jesus in his rightful, most significant place. But that can't just be a once a week thing, right? It needs to be a daily thing. And I would encourage you, try this. Start every day, every day, the rest of this week by acknowledging God's rightful position. Like imagine how your day would look different if you started it by saying, God, you are in charge. You are in charge. What you say matters more to me than what my friends say. What, what, what you say matters more than what the world says. What you want is better than what I want. So I need to be led by your spirit today. I pray that you would be the greatest reality in my life today. Now, full disclosure, uh, when I was in college, I would often start the day by thinking, how much longer can I sleep and still make it to class on time? Right? So this was not like at the forefront of my mind right? when I was waking up in Losher in 2008. Okay, that was, that was me. But I want it to be true for you. Right? <laughs> I want it to be true for you. I want you to set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. Because no matter how messy things get here, our God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is still on the throne. He is still in charge. He is still worthy of worship. And, and if you can just, right now, get your mind on Jesus, right? Just right now. I need, like, think in your mind right now about 
the reality that Jesus is reigning over it all right now. He is on a heavenly throne. He's in charge. He has no rival. He has no equal. You have that in your mind? Have that in your mind. Because when you do, it makes the rest of this passage incredible. It makes it incredible. Why should we set our minds on things that are above? Verse 3, for you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Whew. All right, this is so good. We, a heavenly mentality believes that Jesus is reigning and that Jesus is our refuge. So if you can see in your mind Jesus reigning above it all, then this truth will be so much more meaningful to you. Follower of Jesus, verse 3 says, that's where you are too. Where Jesus is, is where you are, because your life is hidden where? With Christ in God. Whew. Man, if we could just begin to embrace this, reality would change everything. What transforms our lives is not knowing that God is always watching you. Right? That's just behavior modification. Uh, that, that's like your RD walks into your suite and you turn off the CSU unapproved music that you were listening to. Is that still a thing, by the way? Uh, that, uh, my, that my life as an RA when I was here is I would walk into places and all of a sudden the secular music would turn off, Taylor Swift or whatever, right? That was my life. I'm not sure if that's still a thing, but that's the reference I knew from my time here. So I, that, that's just behavior modification. That's not transforming your life. That's just modifying behavior. What transforms your life is, is, is the reality that we are in Christ and that he is in us. So we do not just have a God that reigns over us, we have a God who is himself a refuge for us. He is in us and we are in him. We are with Christ. This this is the gospel that we should celebrate every single day. We were all once in danger. And we were in danger because our sin and rebellion had separated us from God, who is the only one that can provide us with eternal safety. And we didn't deserve protection, by the way. We deserve punishment because we had rejected the authority of the one who has ultimate authority. God is so big, but we have all lived like he is so small. But rather than leaving us in that hopeless position, Jesus, God himself, came on a rescue mission from heaven. Jesus lived the perfect life that you and I should have lived, and then Jesus died the death that you and I deserve to die. He took the just punishment for all of our sin and our, all of our rebellion on himself at the cross. He con- and then he rose from the dead. He conquered sin and the grave. So if you come to the end of yourself and you place your faith instead in the perfect life, sacrificial death, and victorious resurrection of Jesus, if you recognize that he is your savior and king, that he is still in charge, that he is reigning on a heavenly throne and say, I want you to lead my life, that's when all of your sins are forgiven. The righteousness of Christ credited to your formerly guilty account. You become part of the eternal family of God. You are united with Christ, which means his death is your death and his life is your life. You are hidden with him. So hear this. No matter what happens on this earth, no matter what trouble or persecution or danger or student loans come our way, The life of your soul is as secure as Christ is. The life of your soul is as secure as Christ is. So here's the question. Do any of you ever doubt Jesus' security? Anybody? Ever any of you ever think that Jesus is in danger? No, I, I I don't think you do. And because Jesus is safe. That means we're safe. That means you're safe. Because your life is hidden in Christ. (laughs) It's with Christ. And, And notice what took place to make that a reality. Paul says that you have died, past tense. You've died to living for yourself. You've died for living to the things of this world, to depending on your resume, right? Because we didn't just need a small adjustment <laughs> we, or, or a small addition. We needed a whole new life. That's what the Bible says. And so, and so we, we die to ourselves and we are born again into Christ. And I want you to embrace this good news today. 
if you are a follower of Jesus, and this passage is true, that means that your most significant death has already happened. If you're a follower of Jesus, and this passage is true, and you believe God's word, your most significant death has already happened. And I would just say there's a lot of security and there's a lot of comfort that is found in just embracing this reality from God's word. Your most significant death occurred the moment that you placed your faith in Jesus. Right? This is why Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ. So it's no longer I who live, but it's Christ who lives in me. This is why threats and persecution, whatever else, they couldn't stop the Apostle Paul, right? To, to live is Christ, to die is gain. You can't threaten that dude with heaven, right? His most significant death had already happened, and he believed it, and then he changed the world. He changed the world because he believed this reality. You couldn't threaten the guy. He was with Christ. He was secure. My life is hidden with him. But when we don't see Jesus as reigning, and we don't see him as our refuge, right? When you feel distant from him instead of united with him, when your mind is distracted by all these other earthly things, there's so much to fear in this world. <laughs> because there's so many things that can be taken away from us at an instant, right? And there's so many things that can happen to us. And when your ultimate security isn't found in Christ, all other forms of security are very fragile because they're all temporary. And it's no wonder why everyone's scared and anxious and depressed. Right? This, is, this is so practical to how we live every single day. This is why I, I tell people all the time that Jesus is not someone that we add to our lives. Because when you come to Jesus, you give up your old life. Right? You give that up. I don't want that anymore. That's not good enough. I tried it. It doesn't work. I need a whole new life, right? Paul says it dramatically here. You have died to your former way of living and your former way of thinking and your former identity outside of Christ. And so if someone is looking to add on to what they have already accomplished with Jesus, right? That's what a lot of people do. They, they, maybe they, they, they come to church and they start thinking about spiritual things and they want to add Jesus onto their resume. Just in case, right? Just in case. Let, let's, let's just add Jesus to what I have already built and what I already enjoy, and already enjoy in their life. If they're looking for something just to add on to what they're already doing, they aren't actually looking for Jesus. And just to be upfront, for a person that has that mentality, Jesus would drive them crazy. Right? Because he doesn't want to supplement what you are already doing. Jesus wants to take over. He wants to reign in your heart like he reigns in heaven. He wants everything to revolve around him. And our ego doesn't always like that. That's why you can't come to Jesus until you're done living your own way. It doesn't work because Jesus demands all of us. He wants to be the greatest reality in our lives. But if you're here today, and man, you're tired, and you're worn out, and you are insecure, right? If you feel like you can never be good enough, and if all the promises of this world have let, let you down, and man, you just feel like giving up, and you're around all these somewhat happy Christians, and you're, not, you're nothing like that at all. If that's you today, I would love for you to meet Jesus. Because he's amazing. And he changes everything both now and forever. And he's enough. And he wants to give you a whole new life found in him. Found in him. Uh, I, I love the song by City of Light, Yet not I, but through Christ in me. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus. Why? For my life is wholly bound to his. And there's no safer place for your life to be. Hidden with Christ in God. When the race is complete, still my lips will repeat, yet not I, but through Christ in me. So a heavenly mentality believes that Jesus is reigning, that Jesus is our refuge. And let's look at verse 4. When Christ, who is your life, right? Because you've died, <laughs> you're gone, your old way of living is gone. When Christ, who is now your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. So a heavenly mentality believes that Jesus is reigning, that Jesus is our refuge, and that Jesus is returning. Uh, make no mistake, Jesus is reigning now. He is the greatest reality. 
He is in control. I can't take one breath without Jesus putting it in my lungs. The creator, he's the creator of it all and the one who sustains it all. He is not distant or far away. He is here. The struggle is we can't see him yet, right? And we really want to. Like, we just think it would look, make it so much easier if, like, Jesus could just walk in the room and we could physically see him. That would just solve so many problems, we think, in our minds, right? We really want to be able to see him, but we can't, right? And this world really can't see him, right? Like, not at all. And they do everything possible to deny or diminish his position and authority. But the good news is that Jesus will not be hidden from their minds and their sight forever. Because one day, as sure as I am standing on this platform, Jesus is going to appear. And if you are hidden with Christ, you will appear with him in glory. And so if this earthly life has beaten you down, and if you walked in here discouraged and overwhelmed and frustrated, and you don't know how you're going to get all your, all your work done this week, if you thought that you'd be better at this by now, you would have gotten the hang of college or would have gotten the hang of life, and, and things would just be different, I, I want this truth to reassure you today, that your life is not on full display yet. The full reality of being in Christ has yet to appear because Jesus has yet to appear. And and so, yes, we are to reflect his glory now through the power of the Holy Spirit. Yes, we are Christ's ambassadors now representing him to this lost and dying world. But if you're wondering if this right here and now is as good as it gets, the answer is no, absolutely not. This is not as good as it gets. And and I found what John Piper said about this passage so encouraging. And so I, I have this on the screen. Your, your most terrible experience of death is behind you. And your most glorious experience of life awaits you. Whew. Man, if you could just believe that, that'd be amazing. Right? Your most terrible experience of death is already behind you if you are in Christ. And your most glorious experience of life awaits you. This is not all that there is. When the creator, sustainer, and redeemer of life appears, when Christ, who is your life, appears, that's when you also will appear with him in glory. But we don't have to wait until then to start valuing the eternal over the temporary. We don't have to wait until then to seek the things that are above and set our minds on things that are above. We can do that today. We can bring Jesus to the forefront of our minds today. We can see the one who is reigning, see the one who is our refuge, and see the one who is returning. So I go back to the question I asked at the beginning. Are you living here and now in light of what is true there and what will be true then? Because we will never have a heavenly mentality until Jesus is our greatest reality. We will never have a heavenly mentality until Jesus is is our greatest reality until he is at the forefront of our mind instead of continuously pushed to the background. Uh, and, and if I could just be up front, when, when, when I was younger and I heard passages like this, right? Set your minds on things that are above. Right? I thought it was telling me to like think about heaven and like look forward to heaven, right? And, and desire to be in heaven. Anyone else, that's what you think of when, when you hear, set your mind like, you want to be there, desire to be there, those types of things. And to be honest, I thought that that was much easier for old people to do, right? Because most of their good life was already behind them, right? right? And so, of course, it's easy for old people to like, I can't wait to be with Jesus. I'm like, yeah, because your knee hurts so much, right? And so I can't say this in my church. Well, actually, I think I did. But anyway, so, right? Like, of course you want to be in heaven. You don't want to be in pain anymore. And, and, you've, and, like, and you've already gotten to live your whole life. Like, I'm 18. I'm 19. I'm 20. I have things I'm looking forward to, right? I, I want to get married. I want to have kids because I thought my kids would be perfect like I was when I was a kid. And turns out that that's not the case. Um, and so, right, and, and I, and I want to be a pastor, and I want all these things, right? And so, like, like w- this isn't fair. Of course it's easier for older people to have this heavenly mentality and set their minds on things above and desire to be in heaven. I still have a whole lot of life that I'm excited to live. But that's not what this means. Setting our minds on things above is not about wishing for there and then, 
It's living now in light of there and then. Live in light of what is true there. Jesus is on the throne. He is reigning. He is the one that's in charge. He has all authority. He is our security. Our lives are hidden with Christ and living based on what will be true then. Jesus is going to return. And when he does, we will appear with him in glory. Not because of what we have done, but because of what he has done for us. So this is tremendously practical because how you think will determine how you live and you will never have a heavenly mentality until you make Jesus the greatest reality in your life. And so that's what I want for you. And I would love for you to read the rest of Colossians 3 and to see how practical it gets about getting rid of the old self and putting on the new self. And it has ramifications for even our relationships in, in marriage and, and with our children and all sorts of things. Heavenly mentality is not this fantasy world. It is here and it is now and it is so practical. And I want you to live here and now in light of there and then and make Jesus the greatest reality in your life because he is the greatest reality in the universe. Let me pray for us, and you can be on your way. Heavenly Father, we come to you today, and we admit that we are often so distracted by things that don't really matter. We have so many things at the forefront of our minds. (laughs) We often accuse you of being small and being distant, And I pray that we would lift our minds, eyes today, and that we would see you for who you are. That we would see Jesus sitting on the throne. That we would see that our lives are hidden with Christ. That we would see that you are returning one day, and that's when we will appear with you in glory. I pray that you would be the greatest reality in our lives, and that how we think would change how we live. Thank you for these students. Thank you for the opportunity that they have to be in a place where they can be formed spiritually and prepared vocationally for what you have for them. And I pray that they would never try to do it in their own power. But I pray that they would have you at the forefront of their minds so they depend more on you and less on themselves. So I pray that they would experience your grace and your power, and your love today, and that you would be changing them from the inside out as they look to Christ every single day. I pray this all in the matchless, authoritative name of Jesus. Amen.